Will, lovely to meet you. You're the chief exec of Brompton Bikes. Uh, Will, it's rare that one of my meetings will start with a, a ride around the, the forecourt, but Will, tell me all about it. What is happening here at Brompton? Well, we make um, a bicycle, which is sort of in bits there, but actually um, when it's ridden, it's not in bits, and it folds down to be pretty small, a bit like the Swiss Army knife of bicycles, which means if you live somewhere where there isn't much space or you want to chuck it in a car, or you want to jump on a train or you want to take it into the office and hide it under a desk so it doesn't get stolen. But then when you want it, have an amazing bike to fly across town, then you need one of our bikes. And are they aimed at people like me, Will, or should I be an amazing cyclist to have one of these? So we really are targeting, we aren't doing some amazing analysis in an A1B la da male six foot three to six foot four, we are targeting geography. We're targeting a need. And interestingly, globally, there is net migration to cities. We're becoming more urban. And we're living in teeny weeny little flats. And we're spending hours stuck in a little square box that's jolly expensive and belches out nasty fumes called a car. Or even worse, we're, being, we're paying money to go under the ground and into some nasty little metal tube. And we sort of forgotten about the little bicycle which gives us a sense of freedom, gives us a bit of exercise, helps with our mental health, because when you're cycling, you just dump all that stuff out of your brain. So there's huge opportunity in the current climate to bring cities back to life with more walking and cycling, and we hope we can deliver some great products to encourage more people to get back on a bike. So Will, are these only meant for like big cities like London or Amsterdam or Tokyo? If somebody has a need, then they ought to get themselves on a Bromi. And it doesn't matter whether you're in Massachusetts, Newcastle, Lyon. I mean, we produce around about 50,000 bikes. We export them to 47 countries around the world. And we have people who are spending hours sitting in a car going nowhere, now have the freedom to ditch the car. You might get near work, and then, you know, three miles out of town, dump the car, get the Bromi out the back, mm -hmm. and have a blast. It's not a sort of one-way ticket. And it, just introducing a bit more activity into your life, remembering the seasons are changing, feeling a bit of rain on your face, it's good for the soul. And we're all in our hermetically sealed houses with a temperature at 22 degrees. Then we go in our air conditioning car, and then we sit all day doing this, and we wonder why we're getting miserable. Mm -hmm. And we need to get out a bit more and live life. I think that's certainly true for, for many of us. I certainly consider myself a commuter. Um, well, if we backtrack a bit, how on earth did you come to be working at Brompton? So I, um, we all have a funny old journey in our life. And mine started with a conversation with my parents in the car. I did maths, physics, and chemistry A-level. My parents were determined that I'd become an accountant like my uncle. And... Um, I was determined that whatever they wanted me to do, I wasn't going to do. And I'd heard about this thing called engineering. I knew nothing about it. But somebody told me, if you don't know what to do, do engineering, because then it opens more doors and it closes. So I decided I was going to do engineering. They didn't like the sound of that. So I dug my heels in even more. And luckily in those days, you know, you didn't have to pay for tuition fees. So I stuck to my guns and I went and did engineering. And then I was lucky enough to work um, for ICI and DuPont in Middlesbrough on the Wilton site, and that was a blast. I had huge responsibility looking after terrifying chemical plants, but I loved it. It was a real adrenaline rush. Five, six years of that, I stumbled into the best friend of the inventor of the Brompton, um, and he told me about this bike. I mean, I was trying to do an MBA, and I thought I was going to go and do to, to INSEAD and do my GMAT, but my CV was a bit boring and all the cool people lived in London. I, I met this guy with his bikes, and it looked sort of interesting. I thought, well, got nothing to lose. I was 28, thought I'd do a couple of years of that, enjoy living in London, do my MBA, and go back and do something in the North. Well, that was 17 years ago, and I'm still here. And how did that journey actually happen? How, how did you physically end up at Brompton? Who did you meet, and where did it all happen? So I met Andrew Ritchie's best friend, who was chairman, Brompton at the time. Brompton was 24 people turning over about 1.7 million. And um, we're maybe about 400 people. We'll do about 50 million this year. Wow. And um, 
And I was, you know, Tim said, oh, we're looking for some help and you're an engineer and you're just what we need. So out of politeness, I went to look around. I saw the factory. Andrew couldn't make enough bikes. From what I could see, the factory was not well run. It, it, there was so much work in progress. It was just cluttered and there was no order. And, and I thought, my God, I can definitely help. I can do something here. But the biggest attraction was it looked like fun. I, feel, I felt I could contribute. And I liked the idea of living in London. At that stage, that was enough. You know, I was 28. I just piled in. Mm -hmm. It was later that I realized how this bike changed my life and changed the life of our customers that it became addictive and I really committed my life to the Brompton. So many people would say if you worked in chemicals and run plants, why on earth would you shift from process into product? Was that a hard transition? It's all the same. You know, it doesn't matter. I, I worked for um, CalSonic, which is an exhaust pipe supplier. I saw what they were up to in Washington. Then I worked for Nissan in Madrid. You could stick me on an oil rig. You could stick me in a car factory. You could stick me anywhere. It doesn't matter. It's the same. It's people. It's process. It's repeatability. It's clever engineering. It's hearts and minds. It's waste. You, you, it, it doesn't matter. You could stick me anywhere and I'd, I'd, I'd get it better because you just look for the waste. You look for the bottlenecks. You look for the missing bits. And, you know, it's all the same. It's all the same. Let's capture your mindset at age 28. Did you believe you had the potential to be doing what you're doing now and, and be yes. able to do more? Yes. Why? Um, even before that, I tried to do a management buyout of the chemical plant that I was running in Middlesbrough. And DuPont were prepared to sell it to me for a quid. And they were going to sell me a 60 million pound chemical plant for a quid because it had all sorts of liabilities and decontamination of the site. And I got a team together. And then I, 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 I got chickened out and stuck with the MBA. But I, I, right from the start, one of the things that was interesting in Brompton, even though I wasn't thinking I was going to commit my life to it, you take decisions on the base of, look, the worst comes to the worst. I'll do two years. I've got nothing to lose. I'll enjoy it. But you've always got it in the back of your mind. That's, that's, the, that's the one route, the worst case scenario. But then you've always got the other, well, or could go gangbusters. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you know you've protected the worst case scenario, you've got nothing to lose. That's always the one to protect first. And then the other one, well, happy go lucky. Um, but the bike was cool and increasingly it was amazing what it did for people. And Andrew, there was no succession in the company. There wasn't that leadership. And Andrew is an incredible inventor, but he's not a builder of a business because he was way, way too interested about controlling everything. So tell me about the, the first few days when you arrived at Brompton. What was it like then compared to what it's like now? So we worked on MS-DOS. Wow. This is not in 1994. This is 2002. Our, our website was a farce. We had no meetings. We had no strategy. Andrew signed every check. I repeat, check. Mm -hmm. um, we had no budgets. Um, it was incredible. Um, but that's exciting. I mean, I'd come from a world-class company, DuPont, which had world-class operating systems, plans. Um, and yet there are businesses that you don't learn about at university, that you don't see. And there are thousands of them, hundreds of thousands of them in the UK, which are not fulfilling their potential because they don't have the right leadership. And yet they've survived recessions and they're still going. They must be doing something right, but they haven't got that leadership. And um, I was jolly lucky to just roll in at the right place. I mean, the bike is awesome. So I was struck lucky in that regard. But, you know, I was running a chemical plant at 26 in Middlesbrough, which was pretty incredible. I was, you know, plant manager, not from the um, process side, but from the maintenance side. So I had a two and a half million pound budget. I had 14 people working for me at 26 with a coma registered chemical plant. So that was exciting. So. Already, I knew I wanted to get stuff done. So you arrived at Brompton. <clears throat> Arguably, there's a lot that can be done. How did you identify the potential of the business and where you were going to take it? So we had no meeting room. We had no meetings. We had no budgets, no plan, nothing. So I decided that we needed a plan. So and Andrew was a sort of slight kleptomaniac. He wouldn't throw anything out. So he had tons of experiments, past experiments, keep it just in case we might need it one day, everywhere. 
and one of the, the rooms, the offices, was just full of junk. So I just cleared it, got a skip, chucked all the junk in the skip, got a hoover out, hoovered it, <laughs> crappy old carpet, who cares, hoovered it until it looked okay. We had no money. Went to a second-hand shop, bought a second-hand table, bought some old chairs from the Army Navy stores around the corner in um, Brentford. And I said, right, I'm having a meeting, and I'm calling this meeting, and it's going to be called 25K, and we're going to work out how we're going to make 25,000 bikes. People were like, what? What? That's ridiculous. Ridiculous. We can't do 25,000 bikes. What stupid? Well, I mean, that's ridiculous. So we hadn't even had the meeting. Just the name of the meeting was enough for everyone to throw their hands up and go, this is ridiculous. We can't do this. No, we can't even make, you know, 10,000 bikes. How are we going to do 25,000? We haven't got the space. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't. So the biggest challenge was getting people just to believe it was possible and by the time they came to the first meeting, I knew we cracked it because they, they, they came round to the idea that we could do 25,000 bikes. And we did. We got to about 36,000 bikes on that site before right. we finally had to move. So, but half of the trick is believing. If you don't believe, you'll never succeed. If you believe, you might succeed. It doesn't mean you will, but you're definitely not going to succeed if you don't believe. So what were, before you had that... 25k target, how many bikes were you producing? What was headcount? So I think we were doing about 6,000 bikes, 6,500 bikes, 25 of us. And we're now doing about 50,000 bikes, in fact, a bit more than that. And there are about 400 of us. But the other difference is, in those days, we made a bike. That's what we did. Mm. And somebody turned up and picked up the bike and took it somewhere to a shop, to a distribution um, depot. But what's cha changed is we've become very international, but also we are now the distributor in 17 countries. That means in 17 countries, we look after the website, we look after the customer service, we look after the um, technical support, we look after the marketing, the SEO, search engine optimization, social media, in all these countries, in all these places, in all these different languages, all from the UK with little teams dotted around the world. We have our own shops. So, the business has become quite complex, and we've, we've, we've vertically integrated from raw material to shop. So literally, we are taking raw material, and then we're taking that raw material, adding all the value and presenting it to the customer. Gosh. And because I do know you've done quite a lot with your retail internationally, was that always part of the strategy to pull out? Oh, no. No. You need vision. And then if you want to climb a mountain, you all decide, right, that is it. That's what we're going for. You sort of reckon you know how to get to the top, but you don't know because you haven't got there yet. What you will see then, having decided you're going to get to the top of the mountain, is the first horizon. That's the far as you can see. You can only see the first hop. You know it's a false horizon, but it's the first one. So you prepare yourself to get to that horizon. Then you get to the horizon and you go, oh, my word. Now look what we've got because you couldn't see that from down there. Mm. Then you adjust your plan, hopefully you've got enough kit, and you move on to the next bit, and the next bit, and the next bit, and the next bit. So that doesn't mean you're still trying to get to the top, but how you get there, you have to adjust your plan and adjust your thinking and who you need and what you've got to get yourself up there, depending on what you find on the way. So the strategy keeps changing, but the ambition remains the same. So we uh, both will have friends that are trying to grow businesses significantly. What is the key with getting the vision right without stretching it to the point of snap where it breaks down? So I don't think the vision will be snapped because the vision is infinite in many respects. Our mission is to change how people live in cities, to make them happier, to make people um, enjoy their lives more in a city. And as more people live there, millions and millions, we need more of it. That is how we measure success. The implementation of that is the bit you can overstretch. If you set a, a sort of three to five year plan that's too ambitious, you can break your team. And I think the thing to remember is compound growth. Mm. We're surrounded by, you know, I don't know, you know, the, the soccer stars who one minute were, you know, kicking a ball around the back streets and the next minute they're earning 200,000 pounds a week or, you know, a music star who was, you know, singing to a few friends in the pub and the next minute they're on top of the pops and they're some mega superstar. 
what we see is, oh yeah, one day to the next, you go from being just, you know, Joe Soap to, you know, gazillionaire overnight and these unicorns and these mega millionaires. But the world isn't like that. That's not the way the world is. The world is graft. The world is bit by bit. The best line I heard was from an from a industrialist in America. He said it takes 20 years to become an overnight success. Mm. And that's what we've done. It's been 16% compound growth, year in, year out. Few steps forward, one step back, bump yourself here, get back up, keep grinding forward, bit by bit. But compound growth is a powerful thing. And for the first three or four years, all your mates are going, oh, why are you fiddling around with that silly bicycle? And now they're going, bloody hell, you know, you were so lucky to get involved in that bike company. Well, that was 17 years ago. You know, it's, it's just having a long-term view and being patient, getting good people, delivering a fantastic service, caring. And having a long-term view gives you a real competitive advantage because most people are sort of, you know, they want to be in and out. But we, the customer, don't want that. We want someone who cares for us, sells us something, and then what asks us three years later, are you all right? Can I look after you? Anything I can do to help? Most people, oh, yeah, on to the next. Who wants to buy another one? Deliberately make it break, so you have to buy a new one. You know, and, that, and that's not what we, the customer, want. So if you can really care about the customer, if you can worry about them for the long term, I think, you know, you're on to a winner. And you kindly took me for a, a tour of your shop floor and all your production facilities. Uh, it's very rare to see such buy-in from the staff and, and such a united, friendly, proactive workforce. What have you done to nail that with your staff here at Brompton? This is our company. We have something special. We all have a job. We like it. If we don't like it, we ought to work somewhere else. You know when staff like something because the product's good. The number one is the product. But if your staff don't love what they're doing, the product can never be delightful because you can feel it. It doesn't matter whether it's a service or a product. If the staff don't really care, you can feel it in the product. But this is our company. Now, if we all want to be here in 10 years' time, we need to give a shit. We need to care. And I tell my staff everything. I'd rather have 400 people worrying about this business than five. And, and if they don't care, they're damaging all of us. If somebody doesn't care, they're affecting other people in the company's future. And most of us care deeply because we believe we have something special, so we want to look after it. So it's down to us, and we can't blame it on anyone else. You know. And if anybody's got an issue or they're worried about something, they come and talk to me. That's my job, to help people do their job. And link into that as well, Will. I know we've chatted in the past about how you organize your business, so you've got the people that are motivated, but... The other part about how you like to disrupt, could you tell us a little bit about that? So the funny thing is um, human beings are creatures of habit. When we're little and we have our children, the thing that we're all terribly keen to do is, oh, you've got them in the routine yet? Have you got them in the routine? Oh, yes, 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 yes. You have to feed them at this time. Then you give them the bath before they go to bed. You read them the story. They get in the routine. They love it. We love routine like dogs. You know, most things, we all like routine. And, um, but the problem is routine isn't so good for innovation. Mm. You know, if we come to work, we sit at our desk, we put our packed lunch there, and we get our first cup of tea at 8.15, yes, yes, night time. Oh, then we have the coffee at 10.30, yes, yes, yes. We do, 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 do. Oh, it's quarter to five, or it's 10 to six, or whatever it is. Dip, 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 routine. Well, if that's what the whole company is, routine, 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 where's the innovation there? That's no good. We need to shake it up. We need to do weird stuff. We need to try. We need to burn our fingers. We need to accidentally just cut our finger. You know, you give a child a pen knife when they're small. They make a small little cut and they learn to handle a pen knife. Otherwise, you suddenly get some business where they get to 200 million and then some bloke goes and writes off another 100 million because no one allowed them to make little mistakes. So it is a, it's what is perfectly normal, but somehow it's been driven out of us in business. And we over-professionalize companies. We over-systematize companies. We think that order, process, box ticking is the route. You need communication. You need order. You need project management as you get bigger. But you can't take away the ability for the individual to think for themselves and innovate and make mistakes on their own two feet. Do you think everyone can innovate? Or do you think it starts to upset people to start no, with and then they get used to it? Everybody can innovate. Okay. You look at what happens when there's turmoil. 
You look at what happens when you have really nasty things in the world, when you have awful things like the Second World War. Every single person in the UK had to innovate. They had to change what they were doing. They had to live in a different way. They had to do things they wouldn't have dreamt of. The human being is an amazing innovator, but, but we, we like routine, so we won't unless we have to. We like to the same. But you drop people into a difficult situation. You see some of the things that you see around the world, and you think, my God, people, people will respond. They will react. They will come up with ideas. They're, we're survivors. But you need to bring that into business. You need to not be the same as everyone else. And you don't need to be some radically different. You just need to be a couple of degrees off from the same as everyone else. And that two degree is the difference between OK and delightful, average and gorgeous. And that is what you're looking for. And you just need to not follow the crowd and challenge something and say, well, why? Be a child. Why? Why do we do it that way? You know? Surely it could be better. Why don't we do it this way? That doesn't make sense. And, you know, it's like we have the story of the, um, the emperor and his invisible clothes. I say to my staff, if you are ever like that, you know, it's the end. If I'm wandering around naked and none of you are telling me, we've got a problem. I need you to be the little child that goes, oh, you can see his willy. He's got no clothes on. And in so many businesses, everybody knows it's ridiculous, but they're all saying, yeah, 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 well done, well done. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is a disaster. You know, that's, and that goes on in so many, they all know it. You ask them, they know it, but they don't dare say it. Absolutely. Talk to me about brand, because many would say Brompton is a, an amazing brand, but I think you have some quite practical views on brand and how that ties in both with your people and how it ties in with your customer. So people perceive the brand to be the logo, mm -hmm. the latest marketing campaign, you know, the quip, or whatever it happens to be. But actually, 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 when you boil it down, the really great brands are the people who do a good job, that deliver something special. And care about their customer and make the customer happy. And then they associate that happiness with the logo or with this or with that or the other. But particularly today, in a way, actually, that probably strengthens this argument. Maybe in the old days, you could have a pretty ropey product. But if you chucked enough marketing at it, you could sort of persuade people that it's brilliant. But now, you can spend all the money you like on marketing. You can come up with the best lines, the coolest, most perfect, sexy looking people in your adverts. But if the product's crap, somebody somewhere will post it online. And they can, in a moment, they can destroy your marketing campaign with the truth. And that truth can be picked up anywhere, anytime in a phone, and it will go around the world like that. So there is much more pressure for businesses to have integrity to care about the product. And because that's all we've ever done, we've got a competitive advantage. We don't, we're not that interested in all the other stuff. That doesn't mean we don't need to communicate. We need to let people know we exist. We might be a brilliant product for somebody who doesn't even know that we exist. So we have to communicate, but sort of top line, over-exaggerated marketing guff is not my bag. Caring about the product, trying to make it as well as we can, trying to look after the company, not the company, sorry, the, the, the customer for five, 10, 15 years, even longer, is what we're about. And how do people find Brompton? If, imagine if you've never heard of them. How do, how do you actually connect with your company and find? So products? mostly, we've got 600,000 customers. We've taken care, hopefully, that most of them are happy. I would hope that if you've met a Brompton owner, they're a happy Brompton owner. If they are, they have probably told their friends about the bike that they love, or they've tweeted or been on Facebook, or taking photographs, or something, they've probably reached 50 people. Well, 600,000 times 50, that'll do. Significant. That'll do. Where is the future of Brompton going then? So you've got these 600,000 customers. Where is it going to go in terms of your vision for the business? So I think we need to start with where's the world going? And we've created a bit of a conundrum. 
we've created a global climate problem, which is serious, needs addressing. We can contribute a little bit to that, but we aren't going to solve the CO2 um, crisis that we have. And you can't solve all problems. You've got to decide which problems you're going to contribute to in life and focus on them. Because if you try and contribute to every problem, you will contribute to nothing. But hot on the heels of the climate emergency is a health emergency, in my opinion. As we've migrated to cities around the world, so we have seen exponential growth in mental and physical health problems. And mental is less obvious. Physical is more visible. And we can see the physical because we can see that people are not doing enough active movement. They're, we're designed to move. And it's too easy to have a double shot, double caramel, three foot latte, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and if we're not doing the exercise and we're spending all day doing this and we get out of bed and we get in a car, we get out of bed and we sit in a tube and all we do is just sort of literally move five yards and sit down, then who's surprised? And that is going to cost us billions to our governments and society going forward, which and it's not making people happy. But in parallel with that is mental health. We have mental health problems because exercise, outdoor, fresh air is good for the soul. And we live in amazing cities with wonderful architecture. Most people don't even know their city. So we need to get people out. And so I think governments are realizing the value of walking and cycling. And there will be much, much more push, nudging, improvements in infrastructure to get people back out of under the ground, back out of their cars, walking and cycling in their cities, which is where most of us live. So, I think that macro trend is coming, whether we like it, and it's the same in the UK as it is in the rest of the world. What our role is, is to come up with amazing products that fit into that macro change, use material science, engineering, electric drive, apps, to create something that's genuinely useful and makes people enjoy themselves more. And that's what we've been doing for 40 years, and we've got some quite cool ideas coming down the track. Tell me about these electric bikes. What is coming in the world of electrification? So we set off on this journey about 10 years ago, and we did struggle, I must say, because unlike most electric bikes, you have to carry ours, and electric's heavy. Um, and eventually we got a bit of help from Williams, the fast car people, and they helped us crack the engineering problem. They didn't exactly deliver a mass producible product, but they cracked the problem. And with that, we were able to make it makeable, and we launched that last year, it's still early days, huge shift in this company because we've gone from being a metal basher to a software and electronics company. But at the moment, we're about 4,000 bikes in and we're being careful, not rolling it out too quickly, controlling the supply. But the customers that have bought it are having fun. They're enjoying it. It's great. And so we're learning a lot. They're enjoying it. And hopefully we're on a journey. And if you look at the, 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 the electric phenomenon that's going on, the electric bicycle is a bit like the smartphone. In Germany last year, they sold more electric bikes than pedal bikes. Wow. It's overtaken the pedal bike. And that was 1.4 billion pound market just in Germany. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very interesting. And you talked uh, there about trying things that are not quite working out. Over this journey of your time at Brompton, have things ever not worked out and you've looked back and thought, do you know what, if I had my time again, I'd do things differently? Um, I mentioned earlier that if you don't fail, you're not innovating. I mean, I stumble from one flipping catastrophe to the next. But those catastrophes are small. They are like getting an electric shock when you touch the fence. They give you a shock, you learn a lesson, but they're not fatal. We are very, very, very driven about hitting our top line numbers. We have very clear KPIs. We are absolutely on the numbers for our core business. Then we have, that's our homework, but then we have 20% of playtime, mm. doing weird stuff, trying. But that 20% of playtime is doing stuff fast, where we can afford to make a mistake, where we can afford for it to go wrong. And as long as you protect the downside, you can relax. You can take risk because you're not betting the farm. 
you're not falling from a three-story building, you're falling from a two-foot log. And therefore, you can be ambitious, you can take risk because you're not falling too far. Then, if you find taking the risk, wow, that's exciting, ooh, there's something there, then invest, do the market research and start getting distracted. Or if you take a risk and it goes, whoa, that wasn't very nice, you stick a big sign up and say, do not do this. This is properly dodgy. But you discover quickly and fast and you move on. Do you think that should be applied to all service and manufacturing companies? Absolutely. Like? All business. You've got to keep making mistakes, but make them little, make them fast. And if they're, if they're bad, big sign. If they're good, then decide to go at it properly. Where do you think the sector is going to be in 10 years from now then? It's funny, with the car industry and with all industries, people think change happens faster than it does. And, you know, I imagine in the 80s, people were saying in 10 years' time, we'd have flying cars. And I reckon today, everybody would say, we have flying cars. We don't need flying, flipping cars in our cities. It's a nightmare. They fall out the sky, they break, they kill people. And what we need is activity. We need to actually go back to basics. We need people walking. We need them doing more cardiovascular. We need some cool app to encourage them to do it. We need better facilities. But we don't need to go sort of into back to the future. You know, in 10 years' time, that'll be, got, that'll be here in a minute. We just need to keep evolving, iterating, and getting better. And if we can take technology and we can take awareness and learning that we see from Northern Europe, we'll have lots, millions of happier people in cities all over the world. That's what I'd like to see. And you've already got your bike hire boxes in London and other parts of the world. Yeah. How do we get them into the other cities that aren't as populous? So we, are, we have a really wild um, bike hire scheme that's unlike anything in the world. We've been at it seven years. And um, that was us taking a risk, and we're still taking a risk because it's flipping difficult. But it's super cool. We're only in the UK, we're in 20 cities, and it's so cool because you pick up a Bromi off your phone using an app, but the average hire is four and a half days. So you can pick it up, you can take it for two weeks. You can, you know, if you turn up into a city, you can pick it up for three days and it's your bike. You know, you've got it for the duration. Three pounds fifty a day, it's a bargain. Um, so we're working with developers, councils, all sorts. Give us a shout. <laughs> Desperate to get more of them across the UK. And more and more people will see your bikes, more and more people will hire them. If, uh, if I was a young engineer um, looking at your business now and thinking, you know, should I study engineering? What would you say, I guess, to yourself back as a, a young Newcastle grad then, or even to people doing their A-levels, what should we be saying about engineering? We have some really big global problems coming our way. We are more than capable of solving them. The technology exists. What we need is brain power. We don't want to waste precious brains moving numbers on a flipping computer. That is a waste of good brains. And I saw plenty of my friends who did engineering who wasted their brains moving numbers around on the screen. What we need is to solve some of these big, big global problems. And you can often solve big problems in a little way. Lots of little things will solve big problems. And, you know, it's an exciting time. Technology is moving fast. Innovation is going at 100 miles an hour. And the most important thing is, if you're in engineering in the right place, you can make the world a little bit better. That's a really tremendously exciting opportunity for anybody to contribute to the world. And your bikes are clearly making everyone's lives a bit better, which is part of the, the message of Brompton. If, um, if you weren't doing this, Will, what else would you do in life? I think I spent five years running a chemical plant. I'm a greenie at heart. And friends of mine were like, Will, what are you doing? You know, you're, 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 you're sort of, you know, working with the devil. Chemicals, nasty. I said, listen, guys, there's two approaches. You can either be the person outside with a banner saying, I don't like this. You can be the flipping person running it and determining how it's done. My approach has been the latter. I want to get stuck in. I don't know what I might have ended up doing. I could have done anything, but I'd try and contribute. That's what I try and do in whatever I did. I loved, when
when I was working in Middlesbrough. We had a riot. We, we tried to deliver the best. We tried to deliver it as safely as possible. We tried to contribute. And that's the thing. The challenge is the excitement. And if you can contribute to your staff, you can contribute to society, then you feel like you've done a good job. Will, it's been delightful to meet you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.